Please welcome to the stage Dr. Angela Kim, Dr. Susanna Ming Lo, Dr. Grace Kim, and Dr. Yashu Leong. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome and thank you for joining us today for our presentation, Rest and Care, Asian Pacific American Feminists, Resistance to Productivity Culture. We'd like to first begin by introducing you to the presenters, briefly introducing you. We have Susanna um, Bing Lo, I'm sorry, a little nervous to be up on this stage. Um, Dr. Lo, she is, has an independent practice in Hawaii um, and she is our current president of Division 35, Section 5. We have our second presenter, Grace S. Kim, and she is the clinical associate professor and chair at Boston University and is the Division um, 35, Section 5 president, elect. Um, and we have last but not, oh, uh, you have me. I'm Angela B. Kim, and I am an associate professor at CSPP, Align International University in San Diego, and I am the president-elect for, th uh, for Division 35, Section 5. Last but not least, um, Yashu Leong. Um, she is the program director at CSPP, um, Align International University in Fresno, and she is the co uh, program co-chair for Division 35, Section 5. Uh, we are honored uh, to be here today with you all, um, sharing to share our uh, reflections and perspectives on rest and care. So I will now um, like to introduce Dr. Lo. I'm a little tall. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Um, let me advance these slides. That's us. And if you have questions, please go to slido.com and enter code hashtag 17513373, and we'll have some time after we all speak to um, try and address questions, because we'd like to this to be um, uh, engaging for you and meaningful. Thank you. 17513373. So we're here to talk about rest and care and how resting and caring for ourselves as API feminists is a way of resisting capitalist grind culture and systemic oppression. I'd like to begin by stating the obvious. We, all of us, have experienced events of a magnitude that can, and in some cases has caused trauma. The COVID-19 pandemic, global environmental disasters, and mass violence here in the United States and beyond. I imagine everyone in the audience can relate directly or vicariously to feeling unsafe, that something threatening might be lurking just around the corner for us, for someone we love, or someone we can relate to. I grew up in the 1970s being taunted and teased Ching Chong, Chinese, dirty knees, go back to where you came from, which was California. My parents immigrated to the United States during a time when most Asian immigrants were poor and uneducated. My father and grandfather grew apricots and pears uh, in the Susun Valley as sharecroppers. My mother was a Chinese opera singer and like many immigrants experienced downward occupational mobility and did all manner of labor jobs. I went to UC Berkeley, live in my parents' American dream, basking in the environment of the Bay Area, the birthplace of Asian American studies. I spent my graduate school years filled with optimism that we could eradicate racism and sexism by training people on deep empathy that would catalyze cognitive dissonance so strong that they would cast off their prejudices. Over the years, my idealism has waned. But on November 8, 2016, 
I left my bubble entirely. By January 2017, the anti-Muslim ban was enacted, causing chaos around the world, stranding people unable to go home and students unable to attend the colleges and universities to which they had gained acceptance. Anti-migrant rhetoric escalated, causing harassment, violence, and death in many communities, the Latinx community in particular. My mind went reeling back to the 20th century, oops, sorry. Um, my mind m immediately went back to America's previous hostile laws against Asians and Pacific Islanders over a century ago. For example, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and annexation of Hawaii in spite of the will of the people against it. Executive Order 9066, in which Americans of Japanese descent and their families were forced out of their homes and jobs and incarcerated during World War II. And of course, the propaganda inciting violence against us, the stereotypes of us as dragon ladies, exotic sex objects, Fu Manchu Kung Fu killers, or emasculated nerds. I feared that we were on the precipice of repeating our nation's xenophobic past and that people would die. Sure enough, come 2020, Asians and Asian Americans were scapegoated as causing the COVID-19 pandemic, referred to by the former guy as Chinese virus or Kung Flu. Previously hidden hatred of the other became unleashed as public beatings and killings of Asians, predominantly women and the elderly. Long murdered eight people that fateful day, six of whom were Asian women. Michelle Alyssa Go was killed by being shoved onto the subway tracks during active train hours. Vilma Kari was brutally beaten in front of a luxury building in Midtown Manhattan, and the security guards shut the doors as she lay there on the ground. Christina Yuna Lee was followed home and murdered in her own apartment in 2022. Visha Ratanapakti, on one of his daily walks in his neighborhood, was viciously attacked and later died of his wounds in the hospital. Sometimes I thank the universe my parents are no longer alive to experience this social and political regression. My father, in his older years, tried to be an ambassador of sorts of Chinese culture's influence on the world. He would demonstrate Tai Chi and Kung Fu at the community college where he worked as a custodian. He thought he had earned respect at the college until at his retirement they gave him a sweatshirt with a toilet and toilet cleaning wand embroidered upon it. My mom, well, I don't ever remember my mom sitting down. She was always hustling from one job to the next, and when not earning wages, she was taking care of us five kids. She was always tired. All she wanted was to have time to enjoy her dramas and relax. But when she was able to retire, she started showing signs of dementia. And so began a long descent into lost memories and lost faculties. She never was able to enjoy the time she had earned. So when I think about the resurgence of AAPI hate among many other atrocities in this world, it is a painful awakening. This life right now is not the rehearsal. This is the show. In meditation practice, we are taught that the breath is a reminder of impermanence. After this next exhalation, there is no guarantee that we will breathe again. The immigrant hustle is no guarantee of wealth or status. Furthermore, wealth and status are no guarantees of happiness or contentment. It is easy to become immersed in the urgency to stem the tide of hatred and violence. And we need to. 
All of you are in the mental health field, teaching, training, practicing, researching, fighting the good fight. And we Asian Pacific American feminist psychologists, well, hey, the personal is professional. We are responding to the call for intersectional feminist praxis to seek justice and empower people to create equity for all. What we don't have to do, because it is not mandated, is to take care of ourselves. It is a choice to take time for deep breaths. It is a choice to recognize our fatigue and not shrug it off because there's something we have to get done. It is a choice to soothe the knot in our neck and live life not as a series of things to be done that are not yet done, or for that matter, are the responsibilities of other people that we then add to our own list and make sure get done. When we choose not to take care of ourselves, what does that look like? Are we talking about no spa days or Netflix and chill? Well, I'd like to share some examples from my clinical practice in Honolulu, Hawaii, where I see predominantly women of Asian, Native Hawaiian, Chamorro, and mixed race ancestry, all up and down the socioeconomic ladder. They ignore thirst. They work until the need for a bathroom break is absolutely urgent and sometimes beyond. They cook for and feed everyone else first what they want to eat, eating last and foregoing their own preferences. They allow their bodies to feel sore, ill, in pain, and push through it to keep on working. They read, write, study, meet on screens until their eyes are dry and tired. They experience chronic sleep deprivation or poor quality of sleep. They coordinate other people's health medical health and medical appointments and ignore their own needs for checkups and sometimes their own need for medical intervention. They're the first ones up and the last ones to bed after checking that everyone else is okay before stopping. And finally, they experience shame and difficulty when it comes to needing or asking help from anyone. Counter-transference? When we engage in actions such as these, we allow the disease of inequity and the plague of human violence to shave off some of who we are. Even if we manage to escape being targeted for racist, misogynist violence, we will not escape self-denigration if we ignore our being and therefore our needs. My immigrant parents and their Asian Pacific forebearers toiled under harsh, inequitable situations. They sought for us to get an education so we could have an easier life. What these Kung Flu times have taught me is that the racist patriarchy does not care that I have a PhD. It doesn't matter. I may not live till retirement. And even if I do, I don't know if my mind, body, or both will even be able to savor whatever relaxation I feel has come due. I hope I've encouraged you to reflect on some of these existential conditions. We cannot control what other people do, and we cannot achieve true justice if we are ignoring our own humanity in the process of fighting for it. But it takes awakening to this moment to realize it is our choice. How will I live before I die? How many more days or hours do I have to put off taking care of myself? These times have been rough, and yet I am grateful they have shaken me out of my assumption that I can delay treating myself like a whole human being until the world becomes just. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Grace Kim. Thank you so much, Sujana. 
Um, hello, everyone. It's really good to see you, even though you are a little dark in, in darkness. <laughs> but um, it's really love to, lovely to see you. And also, hello to the folks who are online. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, I read a book titled Rest is Resistance, a Manifesto by Trisha Hershey. I don't know if some of you have read this. Uh, she's the founder of the NAP ministry. And in this book, Hersey critiques the culture that we live in, in which productivity is valued more than our health and well-being. She problematizes the dynamics behind the oppressive system in which the search for profit drives the work. In particular, she discusses the labor that was imposed upon black Americans in order to maintain capitalism and white supremacy in the US history. And she invites us to sort of really think about what it means to rethink rest. I love this book, and I struggled through it. I struggled not because I disagreed. I, agree, I agreed with this book deeply, in fact. I struggled because my agreement was at the conceptual level and not in my lived experience. I really wanted to delve deeper into this notion, truly believe in it, and live out its message. And I struggled with it emotionally, despite my attempt at liking the, uh, liking the book, because rest is really hard for me. And I know that my students know this. <laughs> um, so let me share with you what made it so challenging to fully grasp the idea of rest for me. So I can name a few aspects. One is my experience as a 1.5 generation immigrant from South Korea. As my colleagues and friends here uh, will note, the ways in which work plays a role in daily life, both in my family and in my community of origin, and also within Asian American immigrant communities, are enormous. At a familiar level, I have never seen my parents, especially mother, fully rest. Even as an 80-year-old retired professional, she is still working on numerous projects right now. And when I ask her to rest and have fun, she's retired, she responds by saying that she doesn't really know how to have fun. At a community level, my observation about difficulty with rest in many immigrant communities involve factors such as the work ethics, hustling to make ends meet daily, and not feeling as if one has a choice when they have traveled so far around the globe to a new country, and one has to survive. So now let me note that this is not because Asians and Asian Americans are inherently hardworking, as the stereotypes about our group would suggest that we are. It is more about the historical, cultural, and systemic context my family and others like us have had to adjust to. Another aspect that contributed to my struggle with the book was about the realities of working hard as a response to oppression. And they might be racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, and so on and on. I, like many other marginalized people, received the message that in order to survive and thrive as a person of color, you need to work doubly hard. Forget about putting in 100%. You need to put in 110%. How many of you have heard that? A lot of you. Yes, I see Hyde nodding here. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I witnessed, heard about, and was deeply troubled to see my community being targeted by gendered racism, ageism, and continued threat to our survival and well-being. I started organizing panel discussions, healing spaces for students and professionals to gather virtually, and responded to invitations to speak on Asian American experiences and racial justice. 
This has been a deeply meaningful, necessary, and important work that I was doing for my family, my community, and myself. To support my community in times of hatred and racism, I have needed to work and work hard. And this also meant that my working hours increased from early mornings to evenings. I've never worked harder or more, actually. The beginning days of remote working blur the boundaries of work and rest even further. So now three years into the pandemic, perhaps going into four here, and as I sat with this book for a while now, I have further reflected on the meaning of work and rest. Building from feminist praxis, analyzing the systemic, historical, political, and social cultural aspects have clarified a few things for me. I have realized that wearing myself out to fight racism does not contribute to solving the issues of racism and the big picture. And that's because the big picture is systemic and embedded in the notion of capitalism through the drive for productivity. The individualistic society pushes us to focus only on the individual level issues and individual level solutions in capitalistic terms. So rethinking how I am placed in this structure and how I interact with a system that is oppressive for many individuals in marginalized communities has been a journey of unlearning some of my deeply held notions and some of my survival strategies in light of oppression. Existing and being well as a person of color and a woman, an academic, a mentor, a mother, a spouse, a daughter, in itself, without the pressure to produce, to constantly show up, to work, and contribute to capitalism is a way to rethink my involvement in this system. As Sheda Cafe asserts in Crip Kinship, the Disability Justice and Art Activism of Sins Invalid, power exists in both doing and not doing, in saying, no, not today. This individual and collective power of refusal to participate in capitalism and productivity culture that is detrimental to well-being is something that I'm really leaning into and I'm considering as I make choices. So I'll wrap up by acknowledging that I am still struggling. I'm struggling with rest and care, and yet I am making small steps toward them as I realize that rest is about freedom and liberation. So let me pause here, and now I'll invite Dr. Angela Kim to share her perspectives. Thank you. the podium. Oops, Thank you, Dr. Susanna Lowe and Dr. Grace Kim for your powerful presentations. Um, before I begin, I'd like to take a, a quick poll, like a, a show of hands. How many of you are like the clients, like the clients have ignored your um, care for yourself and displayed those? Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's not supposed to be up right now. <laughs> and um, had those behavioral, uh, the, the symptoms that um, Dr. Lowe listed. Yes, not many of you, huh? But several of you. Oh, yes, I see. It's just blinding here. Um, how many of you um, can relate and struggle with rest and care that Dr. Um, Kim had presented? <laughs> Yes, a lot of you. Um, if, you if I ask myself that question, I certainly, um, definitely have experienced uh, those uh, behavioral uh, 
ways and symptoms and, and what Dr. Grace had mentioned and, and have struggled with it. Um, so, um, <laughs> give me a second here. So, I, like you, have multiple roles. Um, I'm a daughter who cares for a, a mother with terminal illness. Uh, I am a um, sister of six siblings. I'm a spouse, a mother of three children, and um, a colleague, faculty, a mentor, and an advocate. Um, sorry, <laughs> my um, slides have gone. Um, and as, as an Asian American female faculty mentor who believes in being available and meeting with my students one-to-one -one, uh, each semester, um, which has become increasingly challenging um, over the years with increased number of students. I also work in the community, advocating for marginalized and disadvantaged um, BIPOC youth and their family. And this juggling act really leaves little time for rest and care for myself. And in preparing for this presentation on rest and care, I began to reflect more deeply uh, about what I value and why I do what I do. Um, how does my cultural identity influence my view of self? And what do I need in terms of rest and care? Do I know what makes me thrive? And as a um, 1.5 generation um, Korean American um, feminist, I value filial piety, a deep respect for parents and elders, and, inter and an interdependence that one's well-being, um, a community's well-being, affects all of us. I believe in collectively working together to advocate for and advance equity. I also believe in paying it forward. I would not be here today without the support of so many. These values inform my role as a daughter, a sibling, a spouse, a mother, faculty, mentor, and advocate. In Korean culture, self-sacrifice is often seen as noble and expected, making it challenging for me uh, to prioritize sometimes my own well-being without experiencing guilt. Western culture promotes individualism and the grind culture, we can, we can sometimes foster, which, which can sometimes foster feelings of frustration, that I'm not doing enough for my, uh, that I'm not doing enough for myself, and shame for not being productive or doing enough. Thus, I find myself torn um, between the desire to prioritize my own feeling and well-being um, and the pressure to meet familial work and community responsibilities and expectations. I realize that the struggle lies um, in finding a balance that reflects my values while maintain maintaining my physical and mental health. Easier said than done, right? Um, prior to preparation for this presentation, I realized that my understanding of rest was about Calgon, take me away. Um, for those born uh, before the 70s and 80s, um, you would have heard uh, this ad for a bath product um, that implies self-preservation and self-care. Um, you know, uh, this, taking this bath, this product, and having a bubble bath will somehow take this, uh, you know, woman away from all these stressors and burdens and, um, you know, <laughs> the ins and outs of all the uh, responsibilities that she has. But take this bubble bath and, you know, you'll escape all this, right? And so, um, you know, that's been sort of <laughs> ingrained in my mind of what, um, you know, rest looks like, right? I'm looking out for myself. Right? Um, However, after reflection, um, I reframed and realized 
um, I'm seriously over the summer preparing for this uh, presentation. I uh, had a lot more time to be intentional and, and, and reflect on, on um, rest and self -care, uh, and care. Um, so I re uh, reframed and um, realized that rest for me was largely being with my family, my mom, and extended family. I don't do bubble baths, but I do watch Korean dramas. Um, you may be saying now at this point, so Angela, you know, what's your takeaway message? Um, and my answer is to summarize sort of my reflection, um, is that my rest and care may look very different for you. And it will require us um, and it will require us uh, to self-reflect um, and have introspection um, and have an understanding of my own values, my cultural values, and my needs. Because it'll look very different for each and every one of us um, based on our background and our experiences and our um, various roles and identities. From my reflections, I also realized that I must embrace self-compassion without feeling, feeling guilty or selfish. And this involves acknowledging that rest and care are not indulgent acts, but essential for my physical, your physical, and mental well-being and health. So by taking care for myself, I can better fulfill my responsibilities to my family, to my community, and my own personal growth. This process may re require renegotiating re the expectations placed upon me, communicating my needs uh, with family and community members, and understanding my values and needs to integrate rest and care in a way that works best for me. Um, it has to be intentional, and we need to be mindful of our needs. Um, and with that, you know, in the process, as we care for ourselves and as we rest, there may not be such, you know, depending how you think of it, necessarily um, positive, more negative consequences uh, related to that. Um, it may be delaying promotions. It may be um, not being as um, productive scholarly um, for us faculty. Um, but you know, it's essential uh, to recognize also, once again, prioritizing what's important to you and what you value. And that, um, and we uh, recognizing that our actions um, will um, model and influence our children, our mentees, um, our colleagues, and that we hopefully that we um, all have this awareness and are empathetic, and that we can all advocate and support each other to take rest and care for ourselves and each other so that we can you know, be the best or um, as we can be, uh, best mom or, or um, a, a, you know, a professor or a faculty um, or clinician um, and an advocate in the community. And so I say rest provides the power needed to be. Uh, the best mom, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the best we can be in our roles. And that rest lends power to be able to rest, to thrive, to revolutionize, to be the agent of change. Rest adds power to be caring and giving to our loved ones and our community. Rest is power to be who we want to be and do. I hope we all make time to rest and care for ourselves in a way that gives us strength and power to do and be. We got this. 
Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. I now would like to introduce Dr. Liang. Rest is a state of mind. Rest is not in action, lack of action, or going missing in action. Rest is the state of mind where we put an intentional pause on grind culture, on the expectations to conform to the systems that permeate our society. Growing up in Taiwan, I was immersed in grind culture. There was a strong emphasis on education and above all, hard work. All I knew was this, I had to push myself to go above and beyond because doing otherwise would mean falling behind. If you ask anyone in Asia who have survived the college entrance exam to get to a top university, they will tell you it's a badge of honor. Growing up in a collective culture with grind culture embedded is interesting too. Collectivist culture value interconnectedness and harmony. In other words, we are deeply aware of how our actions or lack of actions affects others because we are all connected. This, not, this means not only having high expectation of myself, but also other having high expectations of me, parents, grandparents, uncles, and aunts, and close friends. You choose to do certain things because you care and want to meet everybody's expectation of you. Why wouldn't you? Many Asian Pacific American families deal with this. As you might imagine, the need to go the extra miles and prove myself only intensified after I came to the US, first as an international student and later as an immigrant. There are so many places where I feel the need to prove I belonged. Various mastery experiences that help to build this immigrant self-worth. At the same time, as a member of minoritized groups, I've been confronted on, not only by my own limitations and colonized mentality, but also by the realities of racism and sexism in many places. It is hard not to feel the added pressure. Being a member of minoritized groups has opened my eyes to the fact that exhaustion, which marginalized individuals often experience, is exacerbated by multiple systems of oppression, such as capitalism, classism, patriarchy, meritocracy. When we put this conference proposal together, I jokingly say that I'm probably the worst person to present on this topic. Here's why. I walk fast, which is, which is especially for someone who grew up in a small town. I also talk fast, and I always have multiple projects going on. One day after finding out that I have to pick up additional responsibilities temporarily due to some personnel changes, a student asked me, how many jobs do you have? I don't know how you do it all. Do you even rest? Yes, I have a lot going on. But here's the thing, just because I have, I'm, you see me everywhere doesn't mean that I don't rest. People also think I can do it all. Really? Michelle Obama, uh, on her recent book tour, said, many women want to do it all. In fact, she said, you can have it all, but just not at the same time. As you can see, the pressure on women to do it all is overwhelming. This is my response to that student. You have 24 hours. I also only have 24 hours. You don't see what I put on the back burner. I actually have to rotate my priorities. And there's no way I can do it all at all times. And I also have incredible family and family, uh, friends support, support. I thought to myself, rest has to be more than what we can see or what we cannot see. Just because I'm full of actions doesn't mean that I do not rest. There are so many things that keep me busy but also make me happy. Does that mean that I do those things because I simply just cannot re resist, uh, resist the temptation of grind culture? Am I not resting enough? 
Do I risk for myself, for other people's gazes, and based on other people's perspectives? And whose standards are those anyway? Why do I have to believe that taking a bubble bath is self-care, but cooking a meal for my family is not? Why does my risk have to be observable to others? Now, let me introduce a little bit about the feminist principle I practice in life. My feminist work is grounded in Jim Baker Miller's relational cultural theory, with authenticity, connection, and mutuality are core concepts. This theory tells us that we as a human being grow through and towards connection. When both parties can be their real selves and there is give and take in the relationship, people feel a sense of zest and desire even more connection. And to foster growth in a relationship is to stay authentic, empower each other mutually, and work through disconnection. So what if we apply these principles to the relationship we have with ourselves, especially with our bodies? Do I feel disconnected from myself? Can I still act authentically when my feelings are hurt? Do I keep taking and taking from my body by working too much and not mutually respecting what my body has provided me? In this culture, we talk more about the pursuit of happiness than the finding of contentment. I wonder if that's partly why choosing rest is so hard. Contentment in Chinese is man zu. The first character, man, means full. The second character, zu, means enough. The combination of these two characters means contentment. Needless to say, when you feel content, you feel full and enough. Speaking of Chinese, my kids can only speak a little bit of Chinese, not enough to form any sentences. Whenever we visit my parents, my parents say they wish they could communicate with our kids in Chinese. My parents actually primarily speak in Taiwanese, but they would settle for Chinese with my kids. I feel like I have not done enough, especially when I know the importance of language development on one's identity formation. And I feel guilty for not speaking Chinese enough at home with them. But what could we have done when they resisted learning a language that does not immediately benefit them in their daily lives? We had to prioritize meaning the, uh, meeting their emotional needs through English, promoting their appreciation of Taiwanese culture, making language learning fun, and creating opportunities for them to do things with their grandparents when we visit. So I told myself that not meeting this expectation of my parents is not a failure on my part. Deep down, my parents and I all wanted the same thing. We all wanted to feel more connected. So am I content with my kids and myself? I am. Yes, I'm enough as a parent. I am enough, my kids are enough, and we are enough. Rest is a state of mind where you feel full and enough. And rest should feel authentic to yourself, not performative. Rest is a call to intentionally pause and recognize you are enough. Rest is an act of love and a whisper to yourself, I'm enough. We are enough. So please rest you can be, so you can be full for yourself and your communities. May you rest intentionally and authentically, not performatively. May you be liberated from having to conform to the boxes others put you in. May you be content. May you feel connected with yourself the person next to you, with the books you are reading, the music they are dancing to, the nature, the world. May you have the freedom to pause and to recognize that you are enough. May we all belong. Thank you.
So now we would like to take your questions. Please scan this QR code or uh, go to sli uh, slido.com and enter in this code. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, ourselves some questions while we're waiting for your questions <laughs> to come in. So, um, so who wants to answer first? Hmm. How about Grace? Okay. <laughs> oh, this question is for everybody, but I'm going to have Grace to <laughs> answer this question. So what do you do for self-care? So a couple things. One, I learned that just staying in my head makes me really exhausted and that really, you know, isn't helpful. So trying to do some physical activity has been something that, that's, you know, that really has been helpful. So doing yoga and or taking walks daily, that has been something that I'm working on. And then the other thing is really just connecting with people, so usually over food. So that has been something that I really value. Thank you. How about Susanna? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> along the themes of um, cultivating awareness, um, sometimes I'll feel something in my body and it'll remind me to breathe deeply. Mm. And so I'll try to take like 60 seconds, just 60 seconds to take long, deep breaths. And then usually that helps me clear my mind and find my intention for the next moment. How about you? Okay. Um, for me, I like going to the beach uh, with my kids and my husband. And, um, and I also like watching Korean dramas, as I mentioned. And I don't know how adaptive you know, uh, that behavior is, but that's what I, it does relax me and, and you know, de-stresses me, for Thank sure. You. Thing. How about you, Dr. Leong? <laughs> you know, I can yeah, share. I, you know, sometimes cooking a meal for my family by myself, alone at home, is so relaxing and such a self-care moment for me. I love that yeah. combination of yes. being alone yes. at the same time. By you myself, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. Anticipating them coming home, like, yes. that's the best moment. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if this question from the audience? Yes, yeah, see, we have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to try to fit in um, at least two of them if I can. Okay. So the first one um, uh, is any recommendations for high school students who are struggling with this? Um, so that's the first question. And then there's an amalgam of questions that are coming in that really seem to get at the core of the tension between the cultural notions of work, productivity, family obligations. Some folks are mixing in the Western um, grind culture standards. And so um, uh, navigating that tension in, in how do you practically do it, um, as one of our questioners said, um, thank you for naming that tension and that sometimes things have to move to the back burner or off the list. So resources for high schoolers, and then navigating that tension, if one of two of you could, could talk to that in the minute or so we have left. Okay, thank you. Who wants to answer the... I'll talk about the balancing piece just yeah. really sure. br briefly. So, you know, one thing that I talk about or think about all the time is that, you know, work-life balance is not possible. Or you, that's what I think. Work-life juggle is something that's more likely to uh, and more feasible in some ways. So, and if you're juggling and you drop a ball, it's a choice about maybe you don't need that ball right now, just leave it on the floor. And maybe at some point you might wanna pick it up again and put it in the mix of the juggle. So that's something that I think about. And that can apply to high school students and at all ages, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I can attempt to uh, address, uh, because part of my presentation was um, you know, that conflict and struggle with both the, you know, a, uh, my Korean um, side of cultural and, and the West um, American um, side and the values related to it. I don't know if I have like a, you know, uh, re like a recipe or picture of how to resolve that conflict, because as I mentioned, I still struggle with it. But I think what we can um, keep in mind is that, um, you know, the part of that was me thinking that I had my understanding of rest was um, I needed to just you know care for myself and if I wasn't I was kind of resentful or thinking what's wrong with me why can't I think of just myself but realizing and reframing that to saying because you know part of my values 
uh, of caring for others, being connected to others, is very important to me. And that um, my, uh, so what I do is I enjoy um, doing activities, going on vacations, doing things with my kids um, and my family and being with my mom, even though it is hard uh, caring for her. Can I get yes. to the high school question really quickly yes, because sure. I realize that we're out of oh, yeah, time. Sure. I really want to say to people who are in high school that your struggle is so real. Um, I have a daughter who is an adolescent and going through the pandemic, um, you didn't get a chance to really experience the social, emotional um, environments that the rest of us had the privilege of having. And so I would say to you, give yourselves a break be kind to yourself. If you feel crappy, that's okay. You know, if, if you need help, it's okay to ask for it. Even if you're a guy, or even if you're someone who's been socialized to just suck it up and like grind through. So I would say, have kindness and love toward yourself and try not to stay isolated. Reach out. There are many of us who are ready and willing to help. Thank you so much. Thank you.